Well, I guess we should go ahead and get started so that uh, I can be in your groceries. <laughs> oh, shoot. I thought I just hopped in at the end of it. I <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I, I had I, I was late because I, uh, I had to pick up my daughter and set, you know, other That's, domestic responsibilities. So. It, yeah, it's really convenient you were late because I got roped into um, helping my girlfriend throw out her two month old Christmas tree, <laughs> which shed. Uh, like a ticker tape wow. parade. <laughs> and uh, then I got to clean that up. And then yeah. I was sitting down with her having a conversation about, ironically enough, time management. And then you texted me. <laughs> and I saw your text and I chucked my phone and I went, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's hilarious. But yeah, so. Yeah. yeah. Not- notifications on that phone is very helpful sometimes. If you would ever. They are. Put them they, in. They originally put them in. That would have been helpful. <laughs> Welcome to the Reintegrate Podcast. I'm Bob Robinson, and my co-host is Brendan Romai. Today's guest was the very first guest we've ever had on the podcast back when we launched in the summer of last year. Vince Baycoat is the Associate Professor of Theology and the Director of the Center for Applied Christian Ethics at Wheaton College. That is pretty impressive, keeping in mind that he had to overcome living on the same dorm floor as me when we were both pursuing our Master of Divinity degree at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School back in the late 80s and 90s. His latest book is titled Reckoning with Race and Performing the Good News in Search of a Better Evangelical Theology, published in November of 2020 in the Brill Research Perspectives series. As a black man and an evangelical theology scholar, he is able to help us white Christians navigate the nexus of evangelical culture, politics, theology, and race. Well, the first thing I wanted to talk to you, Vince, I'm glad you you, you agreed to come on the the program because Mm -hmm. You know, we, we want to discuss a way forward for white evangelicals as we grapple with what we saw in the final months of the Donald Trump presidency, especially mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the insurrection that we mm-hmm. saw at the Capitol building. Uh, some are classifying that as a, quote, a Christian insurrection. Because uh, we all watched it, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, we saw the giant wooden cross outside yeah. the Capitol. We also we saw, saw this, yeah, we, we saw gallows, saves, too, didn't we? But, right, in the gallows, right. But Jesus 2020 next to a gallows is kind of scary, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, there's a man carrying a Christian flag into the legislative chamber. Uh, guy, the yeah. guy with horns. In yeah, well. Wow. A prayer from, yeah. from the yeah. vice president. Yeah, I, 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 saw, I saw that. Yeah. And so it, it's amazing. That won't it's, be the last time something like that happens. So, I mean, it's very, it, 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 It strikes a lot of people outside of the white evangelical camp as a white supremacist Christian insurrection. Yeah. So the question for us is that, okay, as white evangelicals, Brendan and I are like going, oh, what do we do now? (laughs) How do we how do we address this well? And do we own, own up to it or do we deny it or do we what do we do? Okay, happy to talk about it. So what's our what, what what are some things that we could do or to think about that? Is well, that- I mean, I think you you have to ask yourself what you really believe about sanctification. Like I said on, on, on the other thing the other day. I mean, if you really expect people to be entirely sanctified, then don't expect them to ever act like idiots. Uh, if you believe that people can be misled, it's possible that a person can have orthodox beliefs and really be and really have lots of open vistas of transformation that they've never thought about Hmm. right the same way that you might talk about a person that um you're concerned about the way they live their lives because they're drunk they're they're junkie they're a serial adulterer all these types of things and and you know that they went forward to this revival and it seemed like it's authentic and they're always talking about their problems but they are so thankful for the gospel well, you know, this person has a lot of work to do, right? We don't necessarily say, I think that person's out. Sometimes you might, say, but, but sometimes you say that person just needs mercy. Well, I mean, the people who are um, misled and caught up in a political fog also have similar problems if, if, to the extent that they're authentic Christians. 
And then I think there's the fact that there are people probably who did not, who were there, but who didn't, you know, because most of the people weren't the one, you know, it was a percentage that was breaking in <laughs> enough of a percentage. I mean, it was terrifying, but they're, they're willing to just go with their person. I mean, he, he's not the first person where people have had a, a fanatical commitment to a political figure. We, we, we have to recognize that there are factors that make people feel overlooked and disdained under and, and disdained by others. And that, that that's fueling things for some people. Now, some people they're looking for opportunities to reclaim a kind of white supremacist vision of things, even if it's a soft white supremacist version of things, the soft version being there's a way they think America should be, and they're fine for other people to be there. They just don't want to be in their view erased so yeah, some and, and they feel like that they're that they are in danger of being obscured by cultural elites and by minorities that are being championed by these elites, then they feel like they're being pushed aside. Could what I say to my students is I go, who built the modern West? Europeans. You think they do you think that they built the modern West for even all Europeans? They didn't, and they certainly didn't build it for people that weren't European. And so a lot of the things that make the modern West what it is, it is a European production and it's designed for those people. So it's just like if you go to Japan, you know, if you're not Japanese, <laughs> right? Not I mean, just by the color of your skin or, no, the, or no, the all kinds of your eyes, but exactly. by the entire culture, right? In the entire culture itself. Yeah. I mean, you know, it is not for you. So similarly, I think then in, in, in more subtle ways, Sometimes more subtle ways post Jim Crow, there are ways that the culture is still one that on paper talks about, you know, liberty and justice for all. But it really means liberty and justice for all as long as white people are the ones who are managing it. A lot of other people, I don't think that they want to believe that that's what they feel. But the more that you begin to press on the fact that you have a country that for most of its history is operated that way. And then there, are, when you're doing the slow dismantling of that, it's very concerning. It's it's like your world is going away. And then what what what's connected to this world going away? I think is one of the questions you have to ask, right? And for some people, what's going away is a a society where there's also an actual place for historic orthodoxy. And this is where the complications of historic orthodoxy being woven into it sometimes things that are antagonizing its own beliefs about love of neighbor, um, that when it's tied into those things, people have a hard time decoupling those things. What I, what I, what I hear you saying is everything's kind of intertwined in such a way that, that a Christian is supposed to be able to, to unweave some of that, that intertwining and, and start to see individual issues and say, how is this actually helping? And yeah. how is this actually it's, hurting? It's, we, 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 we say it's complicated. It is complicated. Yeah. And, and I think, I guess another way I put it is, if a Christian is really willing to put God and his kingdom first, as defined by God, not as defined by my own sociopolitical aspirations, then I need to be really willing to actually put everything up against sort of the measuring stick of what God's revealed about who he is and what he wants from his people and what he stands for. One of the things that God clearly stands for is uh, being God alone and not not having any patience for idols. Josh Hawley, uh, a representative in uh, Congress, was seen outside of the insurrection with his hand up, his fist up in in uh, solidarity with the with the, the folks out there. Um, and he has been an outspoken Christian uh, using uh Christianity as a um, as a foundation of why he's actually in Congress, right? He he spoke uh, at the American Renewal Project in 2017. He said, "We are called to take the message of Jesus Christ into every sphere of life that we touch, including the political realm. That is our charge: to take the lordship of Christ, that message, into the public realm and to seek the obedience of the nations of our nation. We must rebuild a democracy, not." run by the elites, but by the middle 
the great middle of America, the democracy that allows the working man and woman to realize their God-given ability to govern themselves and help manage the life of his nation. Of his nation? Of his okay. nation, yeah. And so well, that's a mistake he, already, but go ahead. And he invoked he invoked in that in that speech, he invoked the the Abraham Kuiper and every right. square inch that uh, the authority of Jesus Christ is has authority over every square inch of every aspect of human it, life. And therefore that's why we do politics. It was it was a to me it sounded just like a fusion of Kuiperian theology. Like the first half of that was like like sounded familiar. I'm like, okay, this is just like Kuiperian political theology. And then all of a sudden it's ooh, uh, you know, Christian American populism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but as, a, as a Kuiper, as a Kuiper scholar, wasn't wasn't Kuiper some somewhat populist in some ways? And is yeah. is he tapping into that populism of no. Kuiper? <laughs> okay. First of all, the way he quoted Kuiper was wrong. The whole point isn't about taking the lordship of Christ anywhere. Kuiper's whole point is that he's already the Lord of everything. So when he's talking at the end of his inaugural address of the Free University of Amsterdam in 1880, he is making the point that because God is sovereign over everything, then every area of life is a domain where Christians can participate. And so Christians ought to be, if they're, if they're having a place like the Free University of Amsterdam, they ought to be, as Christians, people who are doing the work of talking about economics, talking about law, talking about medicine, talking about the sciences, talking about the humanities, out of having a, a, a commitment to this God who is sovereign. You don't need to take him anywhere. He's already there. So, so it is not about accomplishing a totalitarian project. And Kuiper couldn't do that anyway because he's the leader of a minority movement in the Netherlands. So he called his people, who were most, uh, most of them who didn't even have, were literally, from the voting point of view, disenfranchised um, he, because they didn't have enough land. He called them the Kleinalyden, the little people. Kuiper could not talk about being someone who had a triumphalism in place. When you read him talk about, you know, wanting the Netherlands to be run according to the ordinances of God, or talking about a Christian nation, his whole point is not that this is ma a make sure you convert everybody or you make sure that everybody uh, who disagrees with you is under your thumb. No, actually, you are trying to cultivate a society that's actually creating the greatest flourishing for everybody because of a commitment that where you believe that if you're doing things according to what God has given us, then people are going to flourish. You are not trying to establish the kingdom. You talked about the the decline of light and the, the little people. Yeah. For some folks, they 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 kind of tap into that and say, "This is this is a populist movement." He's instead of the elites taking charge, mm -hmm. we need to be. Well, he was the lead himself. So that's the that's what's interesting, right? One of the things that I I, I worry about is the decline of expertise in our society. You yeah. Know, if you if yeah. you're an expert, we already think that you're full of it. And it's like, why do we even have experts yeah. on anything yeah. anymore? Because the thing anybody... is, though, no, nobody believes that when they when they are sick. <laughs> nobody believes that when they want but their they, car repaired. But they do. But they, they, they do. They, 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 more they, and more so. They, they go to people. holistic medicine. They don't want. They don't believe in MDs anymore. They well, want but, somebody but, to do but, a shaman they, they, thing. thing they, I go to a holistic mechanic. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> so some of that pushback against expertise is people with expertise drinking their own Kool-Aid mm -hmm. and believing that because they have expertise, that now it means they have omniscience about everything. And mm -hmm. then you discover that some of these people, their expertise made them helpful in certain ways, but they were out of their depth in others. Right. I think the, you know, the COVID epidemic has been a great example of people being distrustful of expertise. I mean, I think that's the preeminent example. I think that COVID hit and um, these people who, you know, were, were taught as a culture, you have to trust them. You have to trust science. You have to, you know, trust us that, you know, vaccinating your kids 
won't give your kids autism and trust this and trust that and trust all these things that people question. You know, some of these, some lines of questioning being a lot more absurd than others, but COVID hits all of a sudden. And for several months, there are no answers, you know, and, and the things that everyone, these people, these scientists who were, were looking towards for answers in order for them to be honest, have to admit that at that stage, they don't have any. I think there were, there were two visceral reactions people were inclined to on two polar ends, which was either basically full on overabundance of caution and panic mode, um, listening to every single new thing that comes out, which again, like there's a level of wisdom in that certainly, but you know, for some people that manifested in kind of a hypochondria and a paranoia versus the other end, which was just complete despondence and rejection of any news they heard at all about COVID because they just believe the whole thing is a hoax. Well, I think um, some of the, the problem there is also that you had different versions of the skepticism, right? You have skepticism of the left and skepticism of the right. And I think those things together <laughs> really created the problem, right? Because there are people on the left that are having disdain for the president, et cetera, and when you say just believe the science, et cetera. Um, but, you know, when we get the vaccine, then what happens? Okay, well, who's initially getting credit for the fact that we got a vaccine? Okay, yes, it's Pfizer and Moderna, but it's also the president. So people from the left, some of them are like, well, I'm not sure I want to take the vaccine. Right? Then there are people who, because it's Trump and because of how inconsistent he was about things, they're, they're like, well, I'm not so sure that, that we should be taking the vaccine. Because, you know, and he, he, you know he, he hasn't taken it yet. You know? Uh, you know, you know that, and so even though on the one hand, the thing that ought to be one of Trump's biggest things, where he says, "Look, on my watch, we actually did it against the odds were high against us, but we got it done. And we got two vaccines. We got more on the way. You know, whatever whatever disdain you have from, you could say, well, he did get that done, and that was life saving. Uh, but instead, because of his consistent mixed messaging, because it all it all keeps resolving." To his narcissism, I believe people who hear him criticizing so many things, which he did throughout his presidency, then they're not sure when the vaccine rolls out if they really want that. It seems to me like for a lot of people, there are really a lot of Christians who are embracing like populism and conspiracy because. It gives them a sense of agency, I think, because it gives them something to fight. It gives them something to resist about instead of just feeling overwhelmed by the world at large because we're powerless. Mm -hmm. Here's this specific set of things that are a problem. Here's this specific set of things that we need to be fighting. You know, we need to be fighting uh, the Democrats. We need to be fighting uh, the elites. We need to be fighting the media. These are the things that are causing these problems in our lives. These are the things that are threatening us. It's and, 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 and you do have the mirror image in other echo chambers from the left and from other places. Oh, sure. Sure. yeah. Um, to, just, just to note that. But, but I think part of the challenge for evangelicalism or evangelical movements is that what it is something that's connected to something that's always been a criticism of the evangelical movement, which is that, yes, you have this common confession about truthfulness of the Bible, salvation through Jesus emphasis on that saving work happening through Christ's work on the cross, and that this is something that you share. Well, the criticism often of the evangelical ethos is that it's a mile wide and maybe an inch deep. And when you don't have that depth, when people are not catechized, you know, when they're not taught uh, their faith in a deep way, you have this, it may be an authentic thing, but it's a surface level Christianity that, or an entry level Christianity and when it comes to the things that people are give, get, learning more about and, and, and being discipled by in, in, in deep ways, it's other things from the culture. Uh, it's, it's other things from other movements. And, it's, and part of that's because, you know, part of what the evangelical movement has done well is sort of get the message out and find ways to use the tools of society to get the message out. What it hasn't done as well is find ways for that message to also go deep down for people and their Christianity will wind up looking more like how they're discipled by these other things than by the faith that that they say saves them but then the faith that saves them really kinds up 
kind of winds up being a sponsor of the other things. There are evangelicals who've either been converted from Catholicism or who've learned, well, I'm, I'm an evangelical Protestant and not a Catholic. And one of the things that they'll say about Roman Catholics is, well, Catholics don't even know what they believe. The problem is, uh, evangelicals know enough of what they believe to be dangerous, but not enough for it to ward off the influence of these other forms of cultural discipleship. I wrote a post not too long ago saying that basically apologizing as a pastor for not discipling people well enough so they would be able to see the difference between truth and, and, and lies to be able to ward off idolatry. And I, I do see it as a failure of discipleship of pastoral leadership. Uh, well, what, what I would say is I think part of the challenge of pastoral formation is um, reminds me of something John Wimber said, right? He says, we can't do all these different things as well as the culture does, right? Because the culture does it in a Hollywood production type of way. And that really draws people, right? So I think a lot of evangelicals have felt like we've got to compete with the attractions of the world. So we need to find ways to appropriate the attractions of the world uh, or to talk about how your life can be relevant in ways connected to those attractions of the world. And the hazard is uh, you, you wind up with sort of the wrong way of doing relevance. And so I think that sense of competition with the culture leads to creating forms of ministry that were really good at talking about relevance and how you can have this kind of life. But it wasn't good about saying how irrespective of what that offers you, the thing that really gets you through is a deeper faith, not the thing of the moment that's going to come and go like cotton candy. You know, the path of discipleship is following Jesus through thick and thin. Um, sometimes it's going to be very mundane. It's not always going to be exciting. It's not, your life isn't always going to be happy because the, real, the realized kingdom of God hasn't happened yet. Uh, so we're not going to pretend to tell you that that's going to happen. Uh, but we are going to tell you that God's present with you irrespective of circumstance. And that, and that you'll get foretastes here and there of the goodness of the kingdom, but you're not going to get almost the fullness of the kingdom through anything that you experience in this life. Now, for some people, that's not what they want out of Christianity. They want Christianity to give them the spectacular life. And if you can tell me how it gives me the spectacular life that compares to what, I'm, what I think I'm seeing other people have. And if, you're, and if you're investing in that, then you wind up telling people to be, do all, you know, use all these tools for success. We'll put a Christian veneer on them. And, um, and that's really the bigger thing. And then people wind up basically looking more like the world than transforming the world. The thing that I don't understand is how can um, people who are disciples of Jesus Christ not have a love for neighbor that seeks to understand the plight of our African-American brothers and sisters in a, a allow themselves to see that as opposed to assuming they already know that that is not an issue that needs to be dealt with. It, it, to me, that is like the, the big thing that is kind of like the umbrella that is over this entire thing. It, it really troubles me. Well, the, the problem is, is that most people don't know enough about the actual experiences of African Americans. They, they think they know. And because they think they know, and because there are enough people, you know, you can find a Candace Owens or somebody to tell you that whatever problems they have, it's their own fault over there. Uh, so you don't need to feel bad. And you don't need to. And, and, you know, it's re and really the only voice that, that's over there telling you about what the things are really like is Al Sharpton. And he's a grifter. So, so basically, Candace Owens is herself a grifter who's, you know, <laughs> saying that Sharpton's a grifter. And, and people think that those are the only voices you need to think about. It's like, how about you actually forget somebody that's a pundit and get to know people in, who are across town because they're not in your neighborhood? Seek them out. Find out about their lives. Find out about what they experience. Find out why there's greater stress over there. Find out why uh, they always been concerned about public education over there. Why they're concerned about public health over there. Find out about those things instead of letting some pundit tell you why that's happening. You have to actually get, as Brian Stevens says, proximate. You have to get proximate to people. And it needs to be not tourism proximate, right? It needs to be more long-term proximity. 
Uh, and the problem is, is that people don't have to because most because minorities in the United States are still like 30 percent of the population. So 70 percent of the population that doesn't really need to know that much about the actual lived experience of the 30 percent of the people. And if that's the case, then you can have a kind of tourism of people's other experiences and think your tourism tells you enough about it. And then you don't have to actually deal with ways that you might actually really have some own problems in your own beliefs about how you look at people that are not like you uh, and how there are problems that persist past, well past the legislation in the middle of the 1960s uh, and how, um, you know, uh, as much as we wish there had been a revival by legislation in the mid 60s, we have not had it and we really need to have that revival. But no, you don't have to think about having that revival if you can kind of comfort yourself by saying, I think I kind of got a grip on what this is. So there, 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 for many people, there's not enough that compels them to need to really do the long-term work because it's a long-term work. This is not a sitcom, right? We're, we're talking about decades. I mean, when you've had most of the history, okay, at least 250 years, more like 350 years, but let's go with 250 years of a society that by law has antagonized people. And you can't expect it all to go away in 50 years, right? So because you built momentum with those 250 years, it doesn't just stop. And so to get change that's going to be substantial is also going to take a long time. Unless we actually have some miraculous divine intervention that changes people and leads them to change certain things about, um, you know, the ways that we address uh, what I elsewhere called the residue that remains at the very least of what's been, what was built into the country in most of its history. So if we don't have that revival, then we have to have people being willing to make the commitments to be involved in the slow work. And part of the problem with that is we are a society, no matter what your race is, we st people still basically want things instantly. They want things quickly. There's not long attention spans. And the idea of having to contend with something that is long, complex, and difficult, and not simple. And by the way, that means that you must confront horror. People say, well, I'd rather go to the movies and see horror than deal with real horror. So how about I do that instead? Right. And so the, the point being that th there hasn't been enough that has helped people to see that, no, to address this dimension of love of neighbor, you must really be thinking about what it really means to love your neighbor as yourself and think and, and be willing to ask, one, if I was experiencing certain things and people told me about what I was experiencing, and everybody says, no, I'll tell you what your experience is, or I'll tell you that what you're experiencing is, no, I gaslight you and make you think you're delusional, that you're the problem. I would not be very happy if people did that to me. But, but if instead, if I'm not thinking about how I would think if somebody treated me that way, if I'm only thinking about the importance of making my assertions about what the, the reality of the world is, rather than asking anybody what their reality is, I assert for them what their reality is. Um, it's a way to keep yourself safe. You might not recognize that there's, the way I put it elsewhere, a Damascus Road experience you need to have on this. You know, where, where you need to have the light shine in your face and go blind and have scales fall, fall from your eyes later. You know, because why? Because Jesus said, did you know that the people that you are treating that way are your brothers and sisters in the faith? And they're part of our family. And if you're per and if you're persecuting part of our family, you're persecuting me. But really here's the thing. Um, is your commitment to Jesus or to your comfort? Is your commitment to Jesus or to. Uh, resting in somehow your perfectly omniscient conception of everything, especially race. Senator James Langford apologized to his constituents uh, in Tulsa. He said that he admitted to having a blind spot for the vantage point of his black constituents, uh, especially the Tulsans who deal with this at a higher level than many. So, it reminded me of kind of the steps that I went through. I think first I discovered that I had a blind spot for the plight of African Americans. So this happened when I was listening more to my black brothers and sisters, what they were saying. 
The second was I had, I had to admit that I don't understand what they're talking about. <laughs> what are you yeah, saying? Because right, right. your, your experience is so totally yeah. different than mine. I don't understand. And, 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 so and, and, and it's a range of experiences. It's not one thing. Right, right. So you know, I, I hear Senator Langford saying, I have a blind spot. So I think his next step is going to be trying to grapple with the fact I, I don't understand why you are so upset, but I need to figure out what that is. That's my third one is I felt I, I was attempting to humbly listen uh, to continue the dialogue with my black friends in order to hear both the facts of their experience and the emotion, the heartache that they felt. And then the, the fourth step I had to learn to overcome my defensiveness. <laughs> when you when you, you feel attacked as a white man, it's like, well, I, well, am I the problem? Whether you feel attacked as anybody, probably. So I had it fifth, except the, the fact that I was still, the, the, that Black oppression is real and it's still today. And um, sixth, I, I, I had to finally admit that the evil of white supremacy is still alive and well in our society. And so I think that the seventh step that I'm in is, is trying to speak out and attempt to be an agent for positive change. But I haven't arrived yet. I constantly, I, I don't know what to do sometimes. You know, it's, it's very frustrating. It's, it's, well, it's okay to just admit you don't know what to do. Right. Right. These things take time. That's why I, I like having friends like you. <laughs> it helps me work these things. <laughs> well, thank you, Bob. <laughs> well, thanks for t spending some time with us and helping us work through this again, Vince. Well, I hope that, that there was some light provided in the conversation. There certainly so, was. It yeah. was great having you on again. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Now I get to go run an errand before I go home. And I'm delighted to run the errand. I'm yes. telling the truth. Well, I, oh, what, 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 what groceries do you need to get? What is it? You know, let me, let, let's take a look uh, if, to see, because I think some other text showed up after uh, the first text. Oh, boy. <laughs> Let's find out. Let's see. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Uh, milk is part of it. Oh, it's always milk. I should have bet yeah. milk. Yeah. Well, we milk. could be putting money down right now. So. Yeah, yeah, it's milk, paper Fruit. products, you know, stuff like that. So. Oh. So, yep. But what the good thing about you getting to do the run is that you get to buy something for you, something that she wouldn't usually buy for you. Uh, you I like suppose. Well, yes, yes, yes. A certain a certain candy or a certain donut or something. <laughs> you get to buy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My yeah. wife would never get this, but slightly, I get to get it. Slightly nicer toilet paper than normal. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. right. <laughs> The kind of toilet paper that doesn't just disintegrate when you use it. <laughs> right, right, right. right. <laughs> Conversation always goes towards toilet paper. Oh my god! It's well, my fault. Well, you know, it's 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 like gold in the pandemic. So <laughs> I still can't believe. Oh, that was amazing. <laughs>